Um, welcome to Ask Andy in Erdington. Sadly, we can't be meeting in person, obviously, because of the COVID restrictions, but it's great to have Andy on the line here, being able to give residents a chance to be able to hear his views on um, issues that matter in Erdington and North Birmingham. And Andy, I know you've been a great friend to Erdington over the years, so it's really good to have you here today. Um, is there anything you'd like to say as an opening comment before we go to some of the questions we've got? Well, I'll be very brief because the whole purpose is, quote unquote, to ask Andy through you. But thank you for hosting it, Bobby, and delighted to be with residents. And of course, I'm just sorry we can't do it in person, but hopefully this format will work just as well. So very much looking forward to the evening. Super. Well, thank you very much for joining us, Andy. And uh, um, to anyone who hasn't already submitted a question, please do send them in in the chat and they'll get fed through and we'll try and get through as many as possible tonight. Uh, Andy, the first question we've got, as you, you all know from our campaigns around high streets and trying to do what we can to um, regenerate Erdington High Street, how important they are to local communities. Could you perhaps just touch a bit on what you think the future is of local centres like Erdington? Yes, with pleasure. And I know how very important this is to local residents. And I suspect lots of people on the line are saying, what's happening to our high street? So I'm actually a great believer in the future of high streets, actually. And you might, this is not where uh, just referring to the question, but today we've seen the terrible news that John Lewis is closing more shops. And I find myself as the ex-boss of John Lewis thinking, will they, I mean, I just do not know what they're at because I am absolutely clear that the best retailers will be both online and they're in town centres as well. So I'm still a believer in the high street and the local high street, I actually think has got a very strong future because I think one of the reactions to the pandemic is people will be less inclined to travel into the big locations and want to be able to get everything they need locally. So my prediction actually is we'll see something of a revival of local high streets actually, not with chain stores, but with local services. And we have already heard of that beginning to happen a bit. And then on your particular high street, Bobby, I mean, as you know, I was a huge supporter of the work that you did for the future high street funds bid to government. It frankly very disappointing that we didn't get that funding and of course we all know that some have said that city council didn't fill it in correctly whatever there's all sorts of debates about that but my commitment to everyone on the line today is I don't want that to be the end of the struggle I want us to get some of the things that were part of that brilliant bid through other means and I don't mind uh, anyone knowing that I've personally encouraged the redevelopment of the swimming baths with the Whitton Lodge Community Association for them to continue their great idea for that sort of startup business hub there. And I'm hoping, but can't commit, I'm hoping that the combined authority will step in for funding for that because obviously that didn't secure the government funding because that is a brilliant idea for bringing vibrancy back to that beautiful building and part of Burlington. And you're certainly your drive and um, aspiration really in terms of that project has been, been key in helping us get it forward to where we are. And as you say, hopefully, the combined authority can can help see that um, be financed going forward. On the jobs front, because you touched on the enterprise hub there, obviously infrastructure across the region is hugely important and critical to that and access to jobs is transport links. Um, and could you just tell us a bit about your plans for transport in North Birmingham and then the wider region? So yeah, with pleasure, Bobby. Um, I'll just, so I hope people on the line have seen lots of stories across the uh, region for transport investment over the last few years. I'll just give you one statistic, which I think says a lot, actually, uh, that next year, next financial year, so starting in April, uh, we will be investing seven times what we invested in transport in the year before I became mayor. Seven times. And the head of population will be getting close to the levels in London now. And we were obviously so far behind. And what that has taken is project after project winning the business case so that then the funding comes through and then we're actually busy making the investments. And some of the big sort of high profile investments have been the metro extensions. That's not for Erdington just yet because you have a perfectly good train service, but there's areas of the conurbation that don't have a good train service, obviously the metro extension. And then of course, we've just had the news of reopening railway lines that have been closed since Beeching. And that, of course, includes the Camp Hill line in South Birmingham. So some really big, meaty projects like that. If you come to Erdington, one thing I am very pleased with is we've managed to get West Midlands Trains to honour its commitment uh, when they got the franchise to completely replace the rolling stock on the Cross City line. That will be coming in later this year, brand new electric stock and critically more carriages. So all of the units will be six carriages rather than three. 
So if that's coming and you'll be able to plug in your Wi-Fi and everything else, it's really state of the art, best rolling stock anywhere in the country. And then also there are just some things that may be smaller, but I think are very important. Over the whole area for four years, we've frozen bus fares. That's never happened before for a period of four years in the West Midlands, never happened anywhere in the country. And that has really helped people who perhaps are not the best paid, who have to use the bus. And of course, we introduced our half price fares for apprentices and trainees at the beginning. And those lower fares has actually driven more people to use the bus pre-pandemic. And so from National Express's point of view, that's how the maths has worked. More people, but lower fares. And then, of course, we've also got the bike share scheme that's being rolled out across the whole region. If you went over into Sutton, you see it's already there, but it's coming across the whole region very shortly. And perhaps the last thing to finish on, Bobby, sorry, a long answer, but I know some of your residents will be very pleased with this. We've also given a clear commitment that the next mayoral term, our big target, will be reopening the railway line that runs from the fort, uh, which I think is just out of your patch, isn't it? From the fort, then up to Castle Vale and Castle Bromwich, then into Sutton through Warmley, and then through Sutton Park, out through Streetly to Warsaw. So to beat that big arc connection, and we've just submitted our bid for what they call the Restoring the Railways Fund to reopen that. So really helpful to people in the Castle Vale part of uh, your uh, parliamentary constituency, Bobby. So, but that would certainly make a massive difference to residents. That's really very welcome news, as is the extra trains um, in Rush Hour that will be coming later in the year. That's brilliant. Uh, Andy, we've had a number of questions from people, so I'll try and amalgamate them together around protecting green spaces. Oh, yeah. Um, and you'll know from some of your visits to North Birmingham uh, that places like Shortheath playing fields have been under threat um, of the council trying to build on them. Do you just perhaps touch a bit on, on what you'll be able to do as mayor to try and help save green spaces? With pleasure. Now, the interest, the real, the um, the interesting nuance of this question is green belt against green spaces. So let me try just to draw that out and we'll come to Short Heath as a really good example of this in a moment. So I've given an absolute categoric reassurance that so long as I am mayor, I will try to prevent green belt development. And I'll tell you what really drove me to this, because some of your uh, callers may really relate to this. Four years ago, at the time of the last election, we had the fight to maintain the green belt on the edge of Sutton Coldfield at the fields. Uh, where um, uh, we lost that fight. It was before my time, just before. And I just stood there when we lost that and the city council gave permission for that huge green belt take. And I just thought, this is so wrong. We're taking green belt with all the damaging environmental consequences at the same time as there are vast tracts of industrial land that could be redeveloped or indeed some housing areas that could actually have more housing brought to them. So our absolute categoric commitment that we should stop green belt development. And I'm really pleased that in the last four years, uh, there has been almost none across the West Midlands. So really pleased. But we've still delivered the houses we need. And we've actually doubled the number of homes being built. Last two years, each of the last two, about 17,000 homes, up from about eight. So it's not that I'm denying the need for homes for young people. We're doing that, but we're doing them in the right place. And the way we're able to do that is we secured from government, and literally I was cross-examined by Philip Hammond on this, that was a painful moment. Uh, we've secured from government now about 450 million pounds for the regeneration of old derelict sites. And then that then makes a, a scheme viable for a developer. And a brilliant recent example in Birmingham of this, it's South Birmingham, not North Birmingham, I hope I'm allowed to say that, but it's one we all understand, all us Brummies understand it, obviously Longbridge. Longbridge Westworks, derelict for 16 years after MG Rover went bust, but literally last month it was agreed that we'd got money from government that the combined authority had bid for, we'd done the deal with St Modwins, and the diggers went into the ground to actually start the redevelopment of the Longbridge Westworks, and we're looking for actually 5,000 jobs on that site. So really exciting, and I'm actually pleased to say that wouldn't have happened if I hadn't been banging on their door lobbying for it, so please. So that's the big picture. Now the green spaces, and I know Steve from Short Heath Playing Fields uh, is very vociferous about this. This is slightly more tricky because this is not like a planning, it's not like a local plan piece where you defend the green belt. This is actually about the city council choosing what it does with its green spaces. And I am absolutely adamant that they must defend them, but it is not actually within my remit to make that happen. We can make a lot of noise, we can give them the funding, 
to help them develop their brownfield spaces. And I'll just mention another one because you see the sort of scale of this and it was in the papers yesterday. There's a wonderful development in Digbeth that we call Stone Yard and it was just signed off last Friday. 900 homes on brownfield site in Digbeth. We put, I think it was, oh, I can't remember if the sum was in the public domain. It was many millions of pounds, I will just say. It wouldn't have happened without our cash. And that 900 spaces there, of course, means the city council don't have to come and trample all over green spaces like Short Heath. So it cannot be clearer to me, they must defend those spaces. And Steve, I'll do all I can with you to uh, enable them to hit their housing numbers without having to use your space. Brilliant, thank you. And it's great to have that support. Um, obviously at the moment we're during an astonishing global pandemic, the worst pandemic there's, there's been for a century. The economy clearly has, has taken a hit. What action are you able to do regionally to bring in jobs, secure jobs and bring in investment, help try and rebuild our economy as we come out of the pandemic? Yeah, so um, there's obviously a link between the questions actually, isn't there, Robbie? Because uh, they, they come together. So let's just explain, just, I'll just explain the big numbers first, then come straight to head to Bobby's question. So um, the region was doing well economically before the pandemic. Um, uh, we were growing as far, faster than anywhere else in the country outside London. And the three, first three years I was mayor, we'd actually got 97,000 new jobs and actually had a record employment rate across the West Midlands. I mean, good progress. Still lots to be done, but it was good progress. The truth is, though, as Bobby implied, the pandemic has sort of knocked all of that for six. And we've now got 95,000 more people claiming benefits. So you can all see the simple point. All the progress we've made in three years has been knocked away in one. And it's horrible behind those stats of people's livelihoods, really hard. So now we've got to come together like never before to grow jobs again. So what I've put together, and perhaps Ollie, you could put it in the chat actually, I've put together what I call the mayoral jobs plan. And it's about finding in just two years, 100,000 jobs. So more than replacing those that we've lost, and it's 100,000 that we can actually see, we know where they're gonna come from. It's not on the hope that we get, you know, billions of pounds from central government and a miracle occurs. It's what we can actually see here and now. And it talks about the set, the areas that are going to be providing jobs in construction right now. So for example, HS2, there'll be 5,000 jobs in that. The building of the Commonwealth Games, there'll probably be five or 6,000 jobs there. You think about some of the transport schemes we've just talked about. There's a thousand jobs in creating that. There's a thousand jobs in the house building we've talked about. So you begin to tot them all up. And then some of the big sectors that we're also investing behind, the life sciences sector, for example, that big development down in Selly Oak, they've talked about 10,000 jobs there in 10 years. We've just taken a thousand in our 100,000 numbers. So you can see how it begins to add up. And what we've done is we've said, where is that 100,000 coming from? And a very big part of it, of course, is getting people retrained for the areas where jobs are reasonably plentiful. Health and social care jobs, digital jobs, really important. So what our responsibility is, is to terrain people up who might sadly have lost their job in retail and to go into those areas. And we've got active schemes ready to do exactly that, Bobby. Super. And we've got a question from Suze asked, uh, Andy, is now the right time for the council to be bringing in a clean air charge for the city centre? Right. This is, thank you for the question. Um, um, I need to be scrupulously fair here. Um, the council are under pressure from the government to do it. It would be ever so easy for me to say no, 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 but they are under pressure to do it. And I do think ultimately the mission of clean air is absolutely right. But how they're doing it is not right. Let's be really clear. So we've argued uh, right since the first consultation that it shouldn't be 24 seven. It's not in London. Why should it be here? It shouldn't have the same geography as they're proposing because a lot of business areas where there's lots of small businesses will be badly affected. It should have further help for the lowly paid who perhaps can't make the conversion to clean cars. And it certainly should have uh, more help for people like taxi drivers. So if it was me, I would probably still go ahead with some form of zone. Maybe I'd be able to persuade the government to delay it, but I certainly wouldn't go ahead with it in a draconian a way as it is. And by the way, what they're doing is the whole sort of stick of don't, don't, don't do this. 
What I'm trying to do is find the public transport alternatives to give people the best transport so they don't necessarily have to drive into the city. So, so I hope that's a, a very fair answer because I don't just want to bash because I do think underneath it all, there's an issue that we all reach into. And just one last thought, and Bobby's been vociferous on this and absolutely right. There are other things you can do other than charge people. There's much more carrot. There have been lots of talks, that Bob, lots of proposals that Bobby's made about greening our infrastructure, which would have done a huge amount to improve pollution levels in the city. And frankly, they turned a blind, turned a deaf ear to all of that. So we get this very draconian scheme because they've not done other things. And that, 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 that's the thing they must be accountable for. Why haven't they dealt with lots of the other things, winning those transport investments, putting green infrastructure in over the years before? I hope that's a very fair answer. I think so. Thank you, Andy. Um, Matt's asked about what are the chances of getting cinemas back into our local centres and specifically back into Erdington local centre? Gosh, no, I, that's an original question. I've not thought of that. Um, well, I think cinema operators have had just about the worst time of anybody in the pandemic, so it's probably not the right time to ask. But um, I'll tell you, you'll think this is a mad thing for me to say. Uh, I once tried to buy a cinema, actually, a little local cinema, and um, I was a great believer in it, actually. It's this, it was in a little Welsh town where I go on my holidays. I've been going for years and years and years, as all brummies do. Uh, I'll tell you where it is, actually. This is a town on the Welsh coast, and I did get as far as... Um, you know, putting the bid in to buy the cinema, I had the little team that we were going to do to operate it. And the reason for it, it would be, it was going to be closed. In the end, someone else came in and operated it brilliant. And I was released from worrying about popcorn. But the point was that I understood that it was at the heart of the community. And I actually think there is an opportunity in communities to bring back a local um, uh, uh, local uh, cinemas, actually, because they do provide that sort of glue. Uh, but you can probably turn them like almost into a little art centre. And there's absolutely no reason why in Erdington we shouldn't aspire uh, to something like that, actually. And uh, yeah, I, I think it's a really good idea, actually. Um, uh, it's interesting, actually, another part of the city, you might know the royalty in Harborn. Uh, there, the trusts that are looking to regenerate that, which we're working with, are thinking about a little art cinema. So it's interesting how another part of the city, they're already well onto it and are thinking about it. But yeah, I'd, I'd love to see the thinking on that, actually, because I think it's a great idea. Absolutely. I mean, it's something we've been very keen to, to see come into the area because um, the, the last cinema in Erdington was um, got rid of by the JAG because they owned the site and they needed it for expanding the site, which obviously we're, we're both supportive of the JAG here. Um, yeah. But it did mean we lost our cinema. So it wasn't lost because of lack of demand. It was lost because of the space was taken. Um, so, yeah, it would be good to get one back on the high street. Um, Andy, Joanne's asked about antisocial behaviour and, and what you can do. Now, I appreciate it's not entirely your remit, um, but do you want to just perhaps touch on, on drugs and ASB in the, in the region? I will. And I will touch on the bit of crime that is my responsibility, which I think gives a bit of um, a sort of uh, a feeling about my attitude to this. Um, so I hope, Joanne, you won't mind me saying this. Um, because this is, I, I was very, very fair in how I answered the question about the city council and the, uh, the uh, clean air zone. I'm possibly going to be accused of being incredibly partisan now, uh, but I honestly think that crime in the West Midlands is incredibly serious situation at the moment. And I think citizens have been let down by their police and crime commissioner in terms of allowing it to get to the extent that it has. We've had a Labour police and crime commissioner for nine years. In that period, 44 local police stations have been closed, 44. Uh, and he is still talking about closing the many more of the remaining police stations, including, for example, in Sutton. Now, that is no way to uh, lead uh, local policing. And I am a huge believer that you must tackle local policing and deal with the, some might say, uh, lower level crimes, because it then we all know there's mountains of evidence from across the world that lower level crime leads to more serious crime, et cetera, et cetera. And it makes people feel very unsafe as well. So we have to bring policing back local. And a Conservative candidate for Police and Crime Commissioner is very, very clear about this in terms of getting uh, people up, getting officers out in local communities, getting intel, working in that way. Very, very clear. Now, I'm responsible for one part of crime only. And I'll tell you about it. It's crime on public transport through my responsibility for transport for the West Midlands. 
We do work with the West Midlands Police in what we call the safer travel police. And if you look at records of crime on public transport, crime has actually fallen on public transport in contrast to elsewhere. How has that come about? Two things. Number one, we have an active approach of having our officers out and about riding the network and we've increased the number of officers by using a lot of special constables, a route which has not been taken by the Labour Police and Crime Commissioner as much as it should have been. And we've invested also in incre incredibly in technology. Every one of our public transport vehicles, whether it be train, tram, bus, is all now connected back to our main control centre. So an incident that occurs on the metro can be seen immediately in the control centre. And then we can obviously talk directly to the driver, the uh, conductor, or indeed uh, send out an officer from the Safer Travel Police if need be. So the combination of physical presence and great technology has helped reduce crime substantially on the public transport network. And I almost see it as, as I know it's easier, it's self-contained, but I do see it as a bit of a model that we could follow. And just one last one, because I love this, You'll know that we are the 5G, the new technology 5G trial for the country. Our trams are now 5G connected. And the consequence of that is the image from the CCTV is excellent and immediate. So any incident followed up by the police is perfect, the imagery from our trams. Brilliant. Um, we've had a follow-up question from um, Stephen from the Shortheath um, Trust. He just yes. wants to ask, uh, I haven't told you about this. I met him a few days ago and I, my was going to be emailing you some details about it but he wants to know if you support um their COVID-19 memorial they'd like to have put in in the fields and Beak Hill Park at the back they're looking to um plant 420 trees and bluebells as a way of, of having um somewhere for people to remember obviously those who who've been lost over the year um, it's, over to you Andy if that's something you'd support I mean it's a beautiful idea um, uh, so yeah, it was interesting, uh, it's another local authority, but Solihull were in the news yesterday because they've actually announced the Memorial Woodland um, is, uh, that they're planting as well, I thought it was a lovely idea. So Stephen, I would totally support you uh, as a memorial for the victims of COVID, but I think there's another point as well. Uh, we've got to plant more trees, it's part of what we were talking about in terms of the greening. And just, I think you'll be interested in this, Steve, what we've uh, uh, committed to across the combined authorities, carbon neutrality by 2041. So no carbon by 2041, net zero. Uh, nine years ahead of the government, so we want to be in a real leadership position. But the critical point is we haven't just said we want to do it, as some do. We've got a detailed plan as to how we're going to do it. And one of the thing, and, that, and the plan for the first five years went through our board last Friday. And coming right back to local, what you will be interested in, in amongst the proposals that went through the board, was something called a Community Green Grants Scheme. So we will be making available, through a competition, you've got to bid for it, uh, funding for community projects to green places. So it could be that your woodland would be a perfect candidate for that new green grant, Steve. Um, but the big picture is, my goodness, we've got to have many, many more examples of uh, small local the local plantings as usual. And 420 trees is not, nothing to be shy about, brilliant. Uh, but we do need many more of them if we're going to get to our carbon neutrality target. Absolutely. Uh, so the next question, um, Andy, is about the Erdington litter buses. It's probably aimed at me more than, than you. I mean, I know you know a lot about the litter buses because I've shown you the brilliant work they do locally. But the question is, what support can the council give to them in terms of any additional equipment? Um, and so I just say, obviously, we, we've been more than happy to help get them equipment like um, bags and things in the past. And actually, I met with Dawn and Rob, who actually run the Litter Busters, um, about 10 days ago now, uh, to discuss what they could try and put together in terms of a bid for some schemes in the area that hopefully would in include some equipment as part of that. Um, but obviously, to any members of the Litter Busters listening in, if there is any equipment you need, just please do drop me an email and we'll do all we can to try and make sure the council get you that equipment. Um, Andy, the next question we've got uh, is from Junior, who wants to ask about what can be done to help reduce the number of HMOs um, in Erdington? Actually, so it's a three part question. So I'll give you the three parts and you can answer them as you want. So it's reducing the number of HMOs in the area, eliminate the number of off licenses that sell alcohols 24 hours a day, um, and be more proactive in terms of sweeping the um, roads and graffiti removal. And obviously, I touched on just there about some of the work residents themselves are doing um, through the litter busters to both clean up litter and actually remove graffiti where the councils fail to do? 
So um, I'll give you my view. I might need a bit of help from Bobby because he obviously uh, is right on top of all the local council issues. Uh, I think the first thing I would say, uh, which is much more of an instinctive thing than anything else, is this whole question of litter. Uh, I mean, it appalls me, frankly. I'm very proud of the West Midlands, as everybody knows, but I'm actually ashamed of the cleanliness of our uh, streets, actually. Um, and I'm not going to say too much about it now, but you will see in our manifesto when it comes out in two weeks' time, there will be a big commitment to this. We are going to welcome the world here for the Commonwealth Games next year. We cannot let the world come and see the lack of cleanliness in our city. I'll say in region, but I promise you, Birmingham is far, far worse than any other part of the West Midlands. Um, I mean, there are challenges elsewhere, but not to the scale of Birmingham. And some of our boroughs actually do a beautiful job at uh, their cleanliness, but we have to lean into this in a big way. And thank you for what you all do in your groups, but there needs to be just a change of mindset around this, about not tolerating this as we're ready to uh, welcome the world. And I am going to put my own shoulder into that and we're going to talk about how in the manifesto. Uh, HMOs, now uh, I'm going to ask Bobby just to help me out on this. I thought that the council had actually made a change of uh, ruling around this. And I know you I'm pushed sure very, very hard for this. Yeah, so happy to Andy. Look, I, so we did a lot of work campaigning to get an Article 24 directive into um, Birmingham because as you touched on there, the council had the power to actually restrict them. Um, it wasn't using it. And, and eventually, after having voted against it a couple of times in the council, the, the council did acquiesce and, and agree to introduce one. Um, what that means is a HMO now has to get planning permission. They can't use permitted development. Um, but that does, of course, mean if no one objects when it goes in, um, then they can still get approval. Uh, in the question we had, it mentioned the B23 area. So I'm guessing you might be referring to the um, proliferation there is around Stockland Green. Um, and without sort of being too partisan, and one of the things myself and Gareth always try and do in Erdington is if there's a, um, sorry, not Gareth, he, he, he sits on the planning committee, so he doesn't take part in discussions, obviously, about it in advance. Um, one of the things I try and do in Erdington is always put in objections um, to any HMO applications that come forward in the ward and encourage residents to, we often deliver a local letter around the affected area so residents are aware of the application. Because one of the things that doesn't happen anymore is the council don't tell a wider area um, about applications come in now. They only tell 50 metres within um, area around the site. So obviously, that means not many residents find out from the council. Um, but obviously, that does rely upon councillors being proactive and telling you. And where you have councillors that don't perhaps do that, that causes issues. Um, and on the off licences, I know from personal experience where we will um, object to anything that's 24 hours within both the Erdington area and actually the surrounding border areas, that when we've been to licensing hearings like the recent one um, relating to the garage at Six Ways, which is actually in Gravely Hill Ward, um, the councillor for that ward wasn't there objecting as well. Um, and obviously that makes it much harder when the ward councillors themselves don't go along to object. Um, so it is a slightly political point, but it is one where you, you really need your councillors to be proactive um, because there is a lot you can do in terms of trying to stop them and putting forward conditions, et cetera. Um, but it does require them, them taking a, a leadership role in the local area, if you like. Um, I suspect the other aspect of the HMO issue um, you've touched on is, is probably uh, exempt accommodation, Junior. Uh, and that is something where there is more that needs to be done. So, um, and Andy, indeed, post the elections, is one of the things I was going to be asking um, you, hopefully when you're re-elected, to help yeah. us with, is there needs to be a lobbying, not just at a council, but actually of government as well. There does. Uh, much tougher regulation around exempt accounts. And Bobby, uh, I haven't actually been asked about this a commitment, but I am very happy to give it uh, tonight because I agree with you. The regulations are frankly soft and Birmingham is being targeted by, uh, I'll call them slightly unscrupulous operators here. And we do need to come together, frankly, in this case with the city council, and say this needs to change. I tell you where there's a lot of concern about this in the homelessness task force. A lot of the um, the organisations represented there uh, realise that this is uh, this is just not right uh, because uh, it's uh, it's taking housing stock that should be used in other ways, frankly, and it's not sustainable. So yeah, I would be very very keen that we followed this up together. Super. No, that's wonderful. Thank you. And it's great to have that breaking commitment here. Yes, that's tonight. it. You, you, you heard it first. Yeah. Excellent. Um, 
Jay Singh Sohal, who you'll know very well because he's never heard of him. 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 Never heard um, PCC on behalf of concerned residents about the issues that have been with community policing and police stations being taken away from areas. Yeah, so Jay, thank you for your question. And I uh, I probably uh, said a little bit about it earlier on, but the answer to the question is, of course, yes. So let's just be really clear. The existing Police and Crime Commissioner has and his predecessor have closed 44 police stations. Jay is giving a very clear commitment to stop the uh, police station closures. But the reason Jay asked me this question publicly is the current Police and Crime Commissioner is trying to entrap me into somehow sort of condoning what he's done. But that is not going to work because I am absolutely clear in my mind. It's his decision, his decision alone, and he must be accountable and his party must be accountable at the ballot box for the decision to close 44 police stations. It, is not, it has not been the right thing to do uh, because it has definitely denuded frontline police presence. So absolutely, Jay, I stand four square behind your campaign to uh, not necessarily just stop the proposed closures, think about where we can bring back further frontline police presence, even if it's not in quite the same way as it was before. Brilliant. Um, and you'll know um, well that one of the, the biggest employers in the area is Jaguar Land Rover. Yes. Uh, and clearly, we need to do all we can to make sure that, that Jaguar Land Rover have got a, a strong future here, um, not just as a company, but actually here specifically in, in Castle Brom, down by Castle Vale, where the factory is that provides so many jobs. Can you perhaps just talk a bit about the work you've been doing trying to support them? Yeah, uh, willingly, Bobby, because I think this is um, I, I think this is an interesting story because people don't necessarily think of politicians, let alone local politicians, stepping into this in the way. But I'm very clear, my job is the economy of the region going forward. Uh, and uh, JLR is the biggest private sector employer here. So I need to have the CEO of Jaguar Land Rover on speed dial. That's sort of how it should be. And given my whole business background myself, I just think that's right. And that's what I've tried to do. And a number of things I would call out. Uh, first of all, uh, as they've tried to move to their electric future, I've tried to stand absolutely four square with them. Uh, in terms of uh, lobbying the government for the support for what will become the Gigafactory. And let's just to be really clear why this is so important. They currently make petrol and diesel cars with one or two, a few electric models. The government have said we're going to move 100% to uh, electric cars by 2020 or hybrids will go by 2035 to be precise. So how JLR make that transition is really important. And then the factory that makes the batteries will become the heart of this new electric vehicle. So we need to make sure that factory is here in the West Midlands. So I've been working actively with JLR to secure the funding from government for that. We've now announced our site for it will be in Coventry at the airport, but it will serve their plants across the whole of the West Midlands. Let's be clear, they haven't actually formally confirmed their status as a customer yet, but you know, it's all, their strategy is clear. The Gigafactory alongside it is clear, so it will come together. So working on that. But then there are also some very practical things uh, you work on. The, we've been working on the supply of power to that site as well, the, how expensive that power is. We've been working actually when they were looking back in the summer of 2019 at preparing their whole question around Brexit preparations. I was with the Secretary of State talking about the export funding they had. They received £500 million of funding. I know I was there when it was all negotiated. And then just this last summer, uh, we were down literally talking to uh, the Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, about how he needed to support the automotive industry through the pandemic. So I hope people get the idea from that, Bobby, is that I see it as a key part of my job to be alongside those major employers, understanding what their big issues are, and then frankly being on the case of government to get government to help them as well. Super. You touched on the electrification of the fleet there and obviously that's a key part of, of Jaguar's future going forward and a key part of electrifying vehicles is actually batteries which is the, the biggest component in a electric vehicle could you just talk a bit about gigafactories because clearly if we're going to have a, a future as um as we have in the past as a major yeah. car manufacturing center we need a gigafactory in the region yeah so as i was beginning to say gigafactory is a must win for jlr and indeed for everybody else Bobby. and uh well, you need four components to make a gigafactory work. You need a customer, 
We've got that the JLR. You need a site. Now we've now agreed our site in Coventry. The third thing you need is government to subsidize it because there isn't a gigafactory anywhere in the world that isn't done with a government subsidy. So we managed to persuade the government and I was literally banging on the door of the Secretary of State for Bayes. They put 500 million pounds on the table, enough probably to subsidize two, probably one here and probably one in the northeast of England. That's what they said. And you can see immediately the customer in the northeast is probably Nissan, but we wait to see. But then the last thing we need, and this brings us right up to date, is the guy who's actually going to run that factory. And that is probably either a Chinese, Japanese or, um, or, or Korean company. And the actual status at the moment is we're beginning discussions with companies who might actually run it. I did actually go out to China just before the pandemic. I promise you, it was literally a few weeks before the pandemic to meet a couple of suppliers. That didn't come to anything because it was probably a bit too early, but it taught me a great deal. It was great background. But we are now discussing actively who would like to run that plant. And uh, it'll be a very, very important business for the West Midlands, about 4,000 jobs in the plant. But indirectly, as your question implies, it saves every other job in the automotive industry because everyone will be reliant on electric going forward. Thank you. Turning back to graffiti, um, oh, Peter's yeah. talked about uh, the issue of graffiti across Birmingham. And indeed, if you've been down the expressway in, in recent weeks, you'll see it, it's once again been blighted by tagging all, all the way along. Yes, tagging. Um, could you perhaps just give us some of your thoughts on graffiti? Um, well, I think it's back to, it's, I mean, my thought is that it's just truly awful. Um, I mean, the, the city is just whatsoever. There's a, there's, a, there's a plague of it, isn't there, at the moment? Uh, and again, I would say we've talked about a couple of things. First of all, where's the pride? We just turn a blind eye, we accept it, and we shouldn't. The sort of the whole history of zero tolerance should come here. The second thing is, well, where is the CCTV camera? Where is the policing response to this? My suspicion is it's a relatively small number of people who are doing this. And my suspicion is they're probably captured, but we haven't followed with the capture images captured, but not followed up. So, Bobby, I have a sort of feeling we just can't tolerate this and we should be asking the police what is happening about this. Absolutely. I think it's a bit of that broken windows thing. Isn't it, it is. Where actually, if you let exactly the little that. things get away with. It is. Causes sort of biggest issues. Yeah. Um, and you've, you've talked quite a lot about um, getting new jobs into the area and, and about manufacturing. I think one of the key things, when you look back in Birmingham's history, so you go back to the 60s, the average wage in Birmingham was higher than it was in London. Uh, and we all know now the very opposite is the case. So could you just perhaps expand a bit on, on your jobs plan and, and just talk about how yeah. it's not just about getting jobs, but getting well-paid jobs? Well-paid jobs. It's a very important question, uh, Bobby. Um, now, there are a number of different ways of doing this. Um, but I'm just going to I'm going to choose just two examples, which I think will really, really, uh, and I might choose three actually, which will really prove it. Uh, the first is there are some public sector jobs that are very well paid. So actually, one of the things we've done over the last few months is lobby for government to move some of their jobs here. And therefore it was brilliant to have the breakthrough that Wolverhampton's going to have the Ministry of Housing and Birmingham is going to have the Department of Transport. And by the way, there are 500 jobs certain, and they're not just back office jobs, which was the sort of failure of uh, government jobs being moved out previously. These are senior civil servants. And the reason I wanted those two departments is they're the two where our economy is leading. So to have the people who've got the brains of the Department of Transport here, sat in the city, it'll help work alongside, we've just talked about JLR, we've talked about the massive investment in public transport. It's having all of the bits of that there. So that was a lot of lobbying for those good jobs and it's come right. The second sector that I think is really interesting, which we don't tend to talk about much in these calls, is the creative sector, because actually that is a, a very, very well paid sector. And we've and if you think of the BBC as the poster child for this, we've had a real what's the word, erosion of good jobs in this sector. Uh, you know, those were slightly uh, slightly my age, probably rather than yours, will probably remember Pebble Mill and all of that. Oh, but I think what's just happened. Last week, uh, the BBC announced its big investment in the city, hugely overdue, talking about making primetime TV here, bringing news journalists here. And what's so interesting to me about it is it took literally, I sat down with the incoming director general of the BBC, um, uh, Tim Davey, 
uh, and did the negotiation. And the story there is that when he got appointed, I just sent him a note out of the blue and said, you've never met me, but we're going to talk because your organisation has not supported my city. And the consequence of that was we got that investment. And the reason why I pull that out is the BBC is like a catalyst. If they commit here, others in that sector will commit here. So really important to high paid jobs there. And of course, we know that that comes on the back of the commitment around the film studios being built in Digbeth as well, which will happen, by the way, even though we've not seen uh, a digger in the ground yet. And then the third area is digital. Some of the best jobs of the future will be in the digital sector. And uh, that's why it was so exciting uh, that we saw ASOS make their commitment here. It's why it's so exciting that come like advanced IT in the financial services sector here. And it's why what we're doing is slightly different answer to the question is we're trying to get more people trained really well for the jobs in the digital sector. Because if you go in the sort of um, online recruitment pages at the moment, overwhelmingly it's digital sector jobs that are there. So hopefully your uh, residents will think, yeah, that's you can see how these bits fit together, not just to get any job, but to get some in some sectors that are growing and creating really good jobs of the future. Uh, I think you just touched on there at the end. Another key aspect of it as well is, is about getting young people into those opportunities. Um, so is there anything specifically you, you're sort of also doing to help try and, and tackle the issue of, of rising youth unemployment? Yeah, so this is this is really difficult after the pandemic. We're at 41,250. It's a number that's sort of etched on my mind as young people across the region are unemployed. And it's basically doubled over the last year. So really big challenge. So I think uh, there's lots of government schemes is the first thing to say. There's the Kickstart scheme, which is aiming to have 20,000 people across the region. So you see the big scale commitment there. But the thing that I am particularly responsible for is the training. So uh, 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 in our jobs plan, we've got 10,000 opportunities with our colleges on what we call sector based work academies. It's hardly the most sexy title. We didn't have a marketing degree for that, but the clues in the title. It's about which sectors are growing. How do we make sure in the colleges we get people trained in the relevant skills? Big sector construction, I talked about the jobs there. So actually to get to learn to drive the dumper truck, get to learn to do the brick laying, the carpentry, the electrician, all of that, those practical skills. Then big sector is recruitment for health and social care. A lot of jobs available in that health sector at the moment, particularly as we're not bringing people in from Europe on the back of Brexit. So work with a lot of our colleges on that. And then one just to give a really novel idea, which I think is a brilliant example. It's actually from Wolverhampton, not Birmingham, but I think it's so, so good. We've just put 720 vacancies live with a new faculty there for, trade, for looking for mechanics for electric vehicles. We've talked about all vehicles becoming electric. Most of our mechanics don't know about electric vehicles. 720 new opportunities there. So again, I hope people think, yeah, they're thinking about where the new roles are. And our job, the funding that we have, is to make sure our young people are trained for those roles. Super, thank you much. And that's a really key point, isn't it? As the vehicles turn to electric, obviously it's a different type of engineering that we need for the people yeah, exactly. to fix them and keep them on the road. Um, Andy, just turning to culture for a second. So you might not know, Benjamin Stone, um, who was a, a MP for our area long, long ago, when he was the first mayor of Sutton Coalfield, was an Erdington resident um, at a, the place that's now the John Taylor Hospice. He has the most portraits in the National Portrait Gallery out of anyone um, Who's, who's got any portraits there so because he did a huge amount of photography one of the things we'd love to try and do long term is get some cultural venues into the local area it actually would allow some of that culture that originates from our area to be shown locally again in Erdington what, what's your view on on trying to get culture out out of the city centres and into the regions if you like and and the impact that can have on on local centres uh it's a brilliant question so we talked about uh, cinema earlier on and um, uh, and I talk very positively about that. So I'm a huge believer in this. And again, just the evidence that that's not just talk, it's action. Uh, when we got the um, uh, Cultural Recovery Fund, which was the government's funding for the big cultural institutions, and actually Birmingham did very well from it. I think for head of population, um, Birmingham and Coventry were actually comparable with London um, because we've got some big cultural institutions, the BRB, the CBSO, you name it, uh, the Museum and Art Gallery, but they're all city centre based. And actually other parts of our conurbation did not do as well. So I was straight on to the regional director of the Arts Council, uh, particularly I will admit about the black, some of the uh, suburban areas in the black country being underrepresented. 
And he basically said, well, you're right, Andy, but you've got to come forward with a proposal. So the door is open with the Arts Council. So if there was something about a, a, a really high quality local facility, we definitely could put that proposal together and push it through to the Arts Council because it was basically saying, yeah, you're right, Andy. The region's culture has been it's brilliant. And those institutions that I just named are literally world class. And that's something to cherish in the city. But we can think about more. And they are definitely up for that type of conversation, actually. Brilliant. Well, that's definitely one we will take you up on. Yeah, um, definitely. Peter's commented, welcoming your comments around um, the BBC, bringing more production back to the Midlands, mm. particularly saying that actors and entertainers um, and production companies will welcome that additional opportunity for, for work in the region. Well, some um, of your, men I should say, Bobby, Peter's biased here because he has introduced me to the West Midlands branch of equity. So I know he knows these performers, but he's absolutely right. Uh, there was there were there were there were insufficient opportunities. Uh, young people here would be moving away to London and Manchester in this sector. This will keep them here if the BBC produce more and if we get well, they will. They've already committed. And when we get the studio built as well. So it's spot on, Peter. Thank you. And that's absolutely right. Isn't it? It's about keeping our talent, um, not just in that industry, but in all industries in the region, not going elsewhere in the country, taking their skills away with them. Um, we've only got a few minutes left, Andy, but could you perhaps just touch on the Perry Bar flyover, a topic I know you know well, but which is going to have huge traffic impacts in, in North Birmingham, particularly over the King's Standing Oscar parts of North Birmingham? Uh, you probably saw me put my head in my hands there, though your viewers will, yeah. Um, well, I mean, I, I, you can see for the first time tonight, I've sort of lost my words. I am absolutely staggered as to why a perfectly good piece of infrastructure that supported express buses whizzing over it um, has been knocked down. And I know it's only in the middle of the works at the moment, but you can see the deterioration in traffic already on the Walsall Road. And the, the thing that frustrates me about this is we are busy investing literally billions of pounds in public transport here. And one of the, one of the components will be the new rapid bus route. We call it the sprint route along the Walsall Road, which is coming for the Commonwealth Games, which by the way, will be run by a hydrogen bus. So that will be very exciting as a trial. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're investing I think um, I think the total sum on the Sprint network that we've committed is 85 million. Uh, that's from Warsaw through the city out to Solihull, airport. Uh, I mean, a lot of money that is, but it's about some of the most intensely used routes and it's about to speed it through all the junctions so that people have got something really, really reliable. Um, actually, 85 might be exaggeration. Don't quote me on that, Bobby, nobody. I can't remember my numbers on that one. But we're spending an enormous amount of money to do that, to speed it through. And then in the next breath, the council are doing an action that I know that their internal report said it would lead to a deterioration in journey times. Um, and they've not been honest really about that, but it definitely said that. And so I just think uh, it's the wrong decision. Uh, what we are pressing on with, again, though, TFWM, as I say, improvement in the, um, uh, the sprint facility there, Recent news, we've also committed to a full upgrade, full replacement of Perry Bar Station, um, complete rebuild for the Commonwealth Games. That's the WMCA paying the lion's share of that. And of course, what we will also have committed to in my 2040 plan is looking at how we can eventually get the whole sort of Sprint Metro link up to the sort of backside of Erdington, up towards Boldmere from uh, Perry Bar as well, up the Aldridge Road and through that way. So big plans, but the Perry Bar flyer, but was not the right decision. Definitely, and, and it's a common theme, I think you mentioned there, about the fact that it, the details come out when you look at the council cabinet decisions around this. Obviously we touched earlier on, on the travel tax that's coming in on, on the city centre, um, and the council's own report said that's gonna hurt the least well off in, in the city the most. It did. Um, and yeah, there's some real shame around the decision-making that's been taken there. Uh, Matt's commented, it's been brilliant to hear such positivity on the air tonight, so I think that's, goes to show, I think, the, the verve that you bring to the role as a real cheerleader for our region. And perhaps, well, Andy, do you want to touch on the, the joy it brings you to be our region's champion? Uh, yes, Bobby, you just cut out momentarily. I think you said the joy it brings to me. Absolutely, sorry, being our yeah. region's champion. No, well, I think actually, Matt, it's lovely of you to say that, but I think there's something really important behind your observation, actually. 
which is that um, um, I hope this isn't uh, immodest the way I'm going to answer this. Um, this was a particular new political role that was created uh, five years ago and the first election was four years ago. And I'd been very happy in my business role, but I decided to give up my business role to come and do this role because I actually thought it was very suited to me. Um, I don't actually think I'd be a very good MP, frankly, uh, taking the whip, towing the line, all that. But this role I saw as an executive role leading the region. And it's about putting the cases together for investment for change, finding the other leaders around. We talked about the CEO of Jaguar Land Rover earlier on. We talked about the arts. We talked about all sorts of people in a sense tonight who've been in that. But my role is to be the sort of glue who pulls them together. And then actually to get out there and tell the story and convince other people to invest in the West Midlands. And that's what you do when you're leading your own business, actually. Um, I didn't own the business. I was there temporarily in John O's, but I felt like it was my own business. But that's what you learn to do. And that's why I thought I was suited to this role of being the champion, the cheerleader. And I hope this isn't an um, inappropriate thing to say, but the way David Cameron described this to me, because it was his government that brought in these mayors. Let's remember that it was Conservative government that brought it. Uh, he said to me, Andy, uh, when I want to speak to London, I, as, when he was prime minister, he said, I speak to Boris, who was then, of course, mayor of uh, London. But when I want to speak to the West Midlands, who do I speak to? There isn't a single unifying voice. And I thought, yeah, that's spot on, Mr. Prime Minister. And it was then I thought there does need to be somebody who's that unifying voice, that champion. And frankly, whether you're sitting in front of um, government ministers trying to persuade them to spend a billion pounds on the Commonwealth Games, or whether you're sitting in front of an Indian investor trying to set up a factory here, or whether you are um, talking to a civil servant who you want to get the money for our homeless schemes, that same confidence in our place is what's so important. And I genuinely think this role, confidence and ability to sell the story is a key part of it, Matt. So your observation hints at something I think much, much, much more important than maybe you first might first have thought. I think that's a really important point because actually, you know, when you go to companies trying to get them to invest, if you tell them how bad a place is, they're not going to invest. You need to be singing those positives. Um, not just our local area, but of our region as a whole. And I know that's something you do really well on behalf of our region. Um, we've had a comment from Sue who's asked, uh, can we have more of these webinars? So obviously people <laughs> haven't had enough of us yet. Maybe there's a TV show there later. But Andy, could you just talk a bit about the webinar programme you've been doing across the region? And then I'll yeah, so, so Sue, um, oh, 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 but there are only so many uh, hours in the day. Um, so... There's, again, there's an important principle behind your comments, Sue, and that's why Bobby's invited me to say something. There's a point about accountability here. If you are the directly elected mayor, I do think you should be accessible to your residents. Now, that's quite hard with three million people, obviously. But from day one of being elected, and actually in the previous campaign, I've done these, these Ask Andys uh, until the pandemic struck. We did them pretty regularly uh, in physical locations. Actually, one of the best in the Erdington patch was in the Castlevale Social Club. Uh, and uh, anyone can come along. And just as tonight, I did not know what the questions were going to be about. You could probably guess that I could work out some of Bobby's early ones, some of the big subjects. Uh, but the rest of them, I hadn't got a clue what they were going to be about. And I do think there's something about that spontaneity of accountability. And that's why I'm a great believer in doing it. Um, and it's been interesting that we've been able to do it just as well virtually. So uh, we've done it over four years. But as we, to be very honest, as we've got nearer to the election, we've made sure there's at least one in every major area of the conurbation so that we've been having these for the last uh, few weeks. And we will run up to the election with them. And I'm glad that you think it's a good idea. So, Brilliant. And just to say locally, obviously, we've had a couple of online um, ward meetings. So it's pretty similar to a webinar. Um, but we'll be looking to have some more going forward. And indeed, if, if people are, are saying they're popular and they like this format more than the in-person stuff, then we can look to do more when, when we unlock as well locally to make sure that, that we're as accessible as possible to everyone. Because um, I'd say that's something we've been really keen for. Um, and, and indeed, Sue's just come back to say she definitely thinks it, it's better virtually. So um, that's certainly something we'll look to continue being able to make uh, available to people. Um, we're into the last couple of minutes now, Andy, but I just wondered before I give you a chance to, to make any sort of concluding comments you want to. Um, I can't ask, can't let you go without asking you, given the year we've had, um, what perhaps might have been 
your favourite TV programme that you've watched during lockdown? Because so many people have been stuck at home having to watch TV instead of being able to go out and socialise. I'm sure there's something you, you've discovered that you'd, uh, you'd be willing to tell everyone. Um, yeah, I don't mind. Um, uh, I will, uh, you, you'll actually be surprised by my answer to this. Um, the thing that I've enjoyed recently, uh, has, well, there's actually there's two answers to it. The first one is really cringe making. I did become a bit of a devotee of the of the crown last summer. Uh, uh, you know, I literally uh, I'd never been into it, but I literally uh, gorged on it from uh, from um, uh, the start of the series till about when did it when did I stop watching it uh, before Margaret Thatcher became PM and Lady Di appeared on the scene. So all that's left to be done. Um, so they, I did do that last summer. Stephen Hughes says he's surprised I have time. I made time for that. And then another thing I have made time for uh, recently, uh, and this will be the one you'll be surprised by. There's a really quite uh, sad story called, of a series called It's a Sin. It's just a number, small number of programmes from Russell T Davis. And he wrote about young Londoners in the 80s, in the sort of AIDS crisis. And uh, that's my era, actually. We left university in 85 and went to London. And uh, I certainly couldn't relate to the hedonism of what we saw on the programme. I thought, what did I miss out on? But, uh, <laughs> but to that era, I could relate to. So that was another thing I did make time for, Bobby. Brilliant. Super. Well, personally, it's Line of Duty, which I'd never watched before uh, lockdown. But I, I frankly spent the entirety of the first series pausing it, working out what location in Birmingham it was. And what <laughs> yeah. It was possible. Yeah, that's um, good. Th that brings us to the end of, end of the questions. We've got a, just a minute left. Angie, is there any sort of concluding comments you'd like to make? Well, no I, I, no, I don't need to say much, Bobby. Thank you for chairing is the first thing to say. Thank you very much to everyone who's participated. It's some really interesting. It's always interesting for me to hear what people are interested in. So this I've got a lot about litter and graffiti amongst other more other bigger subjects today. Uh, but most importantly, just to say thank you to everybody because it's been one hell of a year uh, and we're, we've come through it together. But what we've now got to do is keep the optimism, the positivity, because actually people are relying on us to, uh, uh, to show that leadership. And I'm genuinely sure we can regain the sort of positive momentum we had before the pandemic by working together. So thanks, Bobby. Brilliant. Well, thank you much for giving up your time, Andy, for Eddington. It's really appreciated. And thank you very much, everyone at home who's given up this time um, to come and listen to myself and Andy in conversation today. And if there's any questions you think of afterwards or that you haven't had a chance to ask, please do just send them in to the email address. The moderator's just going to drop in the chat and we'll be happy to pick them up outside of the meeting. And once again, thank you very much, Andy, and thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you, Bobby. Cheers.